Hi everyone. Well, hopefully this is the final bobbing head video of the term um, outside of some Zoom sessions that we might wind up having. Uh, but the intent here is to go over last year's final. Now, I'm not going to do very much here because I have given you last year's final and then I've posted the um, answer key. So I don't think there's really much I have to add. Um, however, you know, being a lawyer, um, I can certainly say something. Um, and then I'll quickly go through the um, <clears throat> slides and talk about a few things that I think you know, should give you a heads up. All right, so it's a three-hour exam, uh, same format as the midterm. There's part A, terms. What you should do is you should list all the terms down, get all the definitions beside them, be ready to fire them off very quickly, learn as many as you can so that you can go through the list and go, this one, I know this one, I know this one, I know this one. And then when you go, uh oh, there's three I don't know, then you can look them up, okay? But, you know, don't don't Google them. <laughs> I mean, some of, the, some of the best answers I get on, on questions are Googled. Um, and because the Google answers don't necessarily apply to the question that's asked. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> that's up to you. In desperation, Google, but up, up until then, concentrate on my notes. Um, all right. So three parts, part A, you know what to do. Part B, um, same thing, there'll be question one you have to do, and then you'll have some choice of some others. Um, and you should go through the videos. Hopefully you've gone through the videos. Hopefully you mark down where I said this would be a good part B exam question because um, that'll give you a heads up on some of those. Then in part C, uh, problem, just like last time, fill in the blanks, uh, nothing untoward there. Um, okay, let's... Um, Let's go through last year's exam on um, part A. There was a term, I think, letter of intent, um, or it, maybe it was in part B, question one. Uh, we didn't do that this term. Letter of intent is when um, uh, Peak Performance Pontoons was negotiating with G'day Mate and they were hammering out the basis of a deal. Well, the last thing Garnet Dundee and Benton Counter want to do is commit themselves to something before talking to their lawyers, but they don't want to talk to the lawyers until they've talked to each other. So what they do is they hammer out what they think is the basic content of the agreement. And then they sign a letter of intent, which is not a binding document. It's just merely a uh, demonstration of a commitment on both their parts to move forward to the point where their lawyers get involved. Okay. Um, all right. In part B, um, Question one, yeah, letter of intent came up. Um, signatures in opposite countries through a, a clause called counterpart signature. Um, just going through that uh, boilerplate. Um, uh, one student asked me what a boilerplate was. Uh, boilerplate is the term used by lawyers sometimes. I mean, you know, you can talk to 100 lawyers and not hear it, but a lot of them talk about boilerplate. Boilerplate on a steam engine is the boiler is the um, uh, plate the steel plates that are bolted on to hold the steam engine together so it doesn't go. <laughs> okay, um, and so boilerplate are clauses that hold the contract together, and uh, there's um, any number of uh, boilerplate clauses. Um, choice of law, choice of uh, forum, um, excluding conflicts of laws, med arb clause, force majeure. Um, entire agreement clause, execution and counterparts, inerrant clauses. There's there's lots of them, and um, uh, and you may be asked to list a few of those again. But anyway, um, what else in Part B? Hmm. Um, Article six of the Convention uh, on the International Sale of Goods is important. It was important in the contract assignment because. Um, uh, the CISG would apply to that contract if you didn't get out from under it. Uh, let's see. Uh, the student also asked me what an airway bill was because he'd never heard of it. Um, uh, easy to miss as you're going through the material. There's uh, straight bills of lading, there's ordered bills of lading, and there's um, uh, airway bills. Okay. And there's clause bills, and there's clean bills. Um, an airway bill, a bill of lading is a document that tracks goods um, received by a shipper and going through the uh, logistics process to the delivery point. Um, and it's a document of title, a document of um, uh, 
a receipt for the goods and a document which does one other thing, which I can't remember right now, but that's unimportant. You have to know it, not me. <laughs> Um, but an airway bill, um, because of the way things are shipped through airport and the necessity for um, strict uh, security, <clears throat> it's generally not a document of title. Don't ask me why, but it's not. So it's slightly different than a, a bill of lading. Um, okay. Intellectual property, no problem. We had a really good presentation, plus the materials uh, on uh, the slides. Um, one, one interesting thing that I added this year that we didn't have before was I read some case law and some articles which distinguish between acts of God and perils of the sea, which um, uh, I, you know, I've often thought, well, aren't huge waves acts of God? Uh, but they've actually um, uh, distinguished between those. And I did have a sheet, and I think it's right here. Um, that was on... Um, darn, I don't have it down. There is a slide, though, that talks about that. Okay. Documents required in a uh, um, letter of credit um, is important. Um, bill of lading... Um, certificate of origin, certificate of inspection, uh, the purchase and sale agreement, and um, the marine insurance policy are the general ones. Now, last time I had a clause on there that's, or a, a question on there that said, uh, tell me five important things you learned this term. <laughs> I'm not going to put that on two years in a row. <clears throat> but, um, uh, you know, and the problem there is uh, someone would say, oh, uh, you know, offer, acceptance, consideration, necessity, or, or uh, intention to create legal there I got you know four of them already uh, no the binding elements of a contract is a concept and then there's six parts to that okay or if you um, talk about um, documents required in a letter of credit you don't get to get six points by listing you know five of the document or five points by listing five of the documents but that's not gonna be on so it doesn't matter um, let's look at uh, part C <coughs> um, There was a little bit of uh, uh, something on there about doing good presentations. Um, a little bit of something could be on there again. Uh, that's important, as you all know. Uh, that student that asked me questions said, what's a trade officer? Um, we did cover that in, the in my video lectures, but um, I'm just going to reiterate again. Um, <clears throat> when we go down to Mexico when we have to find a manufacturer if we didn't already have Baja fiberglass which we do um, how would we find one? well we would go down there we'd go to the Canadian consulate and we'd ask to speak to a trade officer it's a government employee whose business it is to know local businesses really well <clears throat> that trade officer would introduce us to a couple of businesses and then we would make our choice <clears throat> Let's see. Pen the counter stepped up to the microphone. Uh, you all need a supplier agreement, and um, there's at least 11 contractual arrangements necessary. We've done that um, <clears throat> in the uh, uh, the presentation by Will Argue, um, but it probably won't be on the exam again. All right, let me go through and see what else there is that might not have been explained sufficiently enough. Um, Patents and public domain um, added uh, a, a clarification this year. Um, if you have an invention and it is ingenious, it's novel, and it has utility, um, then you can get a patent on it. But if you introduce it to the marketplace, you only have a one-year time period before that information is considered to fall into the public domain and is considered prior art and you lose your chance for a patent. Um, if I ask for... Um, Here's a product, <clears throat> how should we protect it? Don't automatically just list the five, okay? Because you're gonna lose marks. Um, <clears throat> generally, if there's a, um, uh, a manual, okay, well, you wanna have copyright in your manual, but if there is no manual, then you don't need copyright for a product, okay? 
uh, NDA, oh, we'll put that down. No, only if the product has been introduced to somebody or will be introduced to somebody before it gets into uh, uh, into some protection, like a, a patent. Because you don't want someone to steal your idea. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, the student asked a very good question, um, and he all almost sounded a little irate. He said, hey, wait a minute, I looked at you know, this year's exam and there's some stuff on there from the first part of the course and you said there would not be any material from the first part of the course. And that's not quite what I said, okay? I didn't say that there would not be. I said to the greatest extent possible, the second exam will not cover material from the first part of the course. And I say to the greatest extent possible because bribery is incredibly important in the second half of the course. We saw that in the presentation from the bribery team. We did it the first part of the course. Oh, I'm not going to ask you a question on the final. Yes, I am. Okay, or may. All right. Because there are things that flow through. I mean, you can't just divorce some material from other material um, <clears throat> that easily. There has to be overlap. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. So, um, for example, there was uh, um, a, a, a very brief question about cross-cultural problems, um, and um, there was a question on the Corruption of Foreign Officials Act, um, and there was, uh, uh, oh, and I guess one other thing I wanted to mention, too, is that um, the presentation by the bribery people was very good, but they missed one point. Um, and that is that in addition to the Corruption of Foreign Officials Act, which is a UN convention which has been adopted by Canada through enabling legislation, there's also the provisions of the Criminal Code in Canada, which says that if we bribe somebody, um, it can be you can be charged with uh, bribery under the Criminal Code. Um, so it's almost like a double whammy here. Um, and worse still, if one of Benton Counter's employees uh, goes down to Mexico, um, uh, Gary Grimes, for example, and he's helping them set up their plant down there, and uh, <clears throat> you know he gives them a little bit of money to do something, uh, well, that's a bribe. And uh, you know <clears throat> the company, because he's acting on behalf of the company, the company can be... Um, charged with the offense. The problem is that the Crown Prosecutor doesn't know who inside the company paid the bribe, and so what they generally do is they say, well, there's no point in having a conviction against the company and taking the corporate minute book and put the corporate minute book in jail because the corporate minute book isn't going to care that it's in jail. So they look for somebody in the company, and the criminal code actually says that the president or CEO can be charged um, with... Uh, uh, <clears throat> with the company for uh, bribery by by even uh, um, one of the employees. So the principal director. All right. <clears throat> one of the things I scream about a lot is um, uh, Myron and Mildred Entwistle are talking to, we'll argue over lunch, and he says, uh, the name of the company is m and Distributing LTD. And argue says, m and Distributing? Well, yeah. Oh, my first name is, uh, you know, Myron, my wife's name's, first name is Mildred, so it's m and because we're partners in this. And argue just about shoots them because he says, you never talk to yourself or express yourself or call yourself partners, okay? If you have a corporation, do not do that. It's like boom, 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 shooting yourself in the foot. Um, <clears throat> if you are in a corporation, you are not partners. And if you call yourself partners, you have just engendered joint liability and joint and several liability. And by the way, those two things are different, okay? So if you say, oh, joint and several liability, there I got two marks. No, you only got one. It's joint liability for the debts, joint and several liability for the uh, torts. Okay, so you never call yourself partners if you have a corporation. Boilerplate came up a number of times in that exam. When I gave marks for it, that's silly. It didn't happen this time. I'm not that generous. <laughs> okay, signature lines. Yes, signature lines are important. The reason it's important in this course is because it's important in business, period. But the reason that I stress it here is that I teach in Batam 107 signature lines. And I generally tell my students if they graduate from 107, I want them to really know two things. I want them to know the six binding elements of a contract and how to get signature lines correct on contracts. 
And then Bannon 307, um, I start them off with a snap quiz to see how many of them remember it. Now the problem with that is, of course, a lot of the students don't have me in Bannon 107, so they have a problem. But my students should remember, and they don't. Okay, Let's go back to 107. Um, I tell them this is important for the contract assignment. They screwed up in the contract assignment. I tell them it's important for the quiz. They screwed up in the quiz. And I tell them it's important for the final exam. And they screwed up in the final exam. Signature lines will be on the exam somewhere. That simple. Okay. Um, <clears throat> because there's no point in having a contract and then screwing up the signature lines. So um, the, uh, Myron had a standard form contract and it said uh, customer and it says by the title, date, supplier, by title, date. We're perfect, right? No, because a precedent is set up like that so that the lawyer or whoever is doing it says, okay, what goes in there? Not that's good. What goes in there? And then you set up the signature lines correctly. So in this particular case, <clears throat> it's M and M distributing LTD per authorized signatory per on behalf of authorized signatory in the world according to Peter Holden you're trying to dodge a liability limit per will work why not make sure the judge has absolutely no leeway whatsoever to hold you personally liable put down that you're an authorized signatory oh am I an authorized signatory for me no I'm me so if I'm an authorized signatory I must be an authorized signatory for someone or something else and here, it must be an authorized signatory for the company, which means I cannot be held personally liable. Um, all right. I am quickly going to go through the slides and say which ones I think are particularly uh, necessary. Um, obviously, under multinational corporations, the fact that uh, common <coughs> civil law jurisdictions, the shareholders declare dividends is a huge difference from common law jurisdictions where the directors declare dividends. <coughs> Private corporations, the shareholders are called associates. Wow. Okay. That's really different, okay, and that can cause a lot of confusion. Slide um, 103 shows the corporate relationship and where limited liability comes into play. This is important in common law jurisdictions, civil law jurisdictions, Islamic law jurisdictions, um, in, under the um, Israeli uh, <coughs> uh, Ju uh, Judean Code. <coughs> it's important everywhere, okay, so you've got to know that. Um Okay, now I'm just going to uh, fire through here. The way the signature lines are set up is shown on slide 105. Um, the convention on the international sale of goods, oh, well, sorry, back up. The material on seals, uh, 112, 113, 114, and um, uh, is really important. Um, the CISG is really important, um, particularly how it functions, okay, which is um, <clears throat> slide uh, 121, seller's obligations and buyer's obligations. It's almost like a throwaway, you know, in the material, and yet that's how it functions, that's how it works, and that's really important. Um, <clears throat> let's see. risk, uh, the risk barometer and the um, uh, risk in international trade is really important. How letters of credit function um, is really important. And that will, will probably be on the exam because, <clears throat> uh, you know, bribery, for example, we had bribery plus we had a presentation. Uh, letters of credit, <clears throat> we had a, uh, a no presentation. And so um, I just covered it in my lecture. Know the difference between de minimis non curat lex and the rule of strict compliance, which is uh, slide 134. Um, <clears throat> uh, risk management practices, 135 is, uh, is important. 
if um, I have trade terms on the exam, I will give you the um, information about how the INCO trade terms work so that you don't have to memorize where risk transfers and who pays. <coughs> know, the, know the various uh, types of bills of lading. Obviously, in the logistics of things, that's important. Um, I'm going fast through a lot of stuff. It doesn't mean it's not important. Um, it just means I don't have to highlight these things. And obviously, intellectual property is important. And that brings us to the last slide. Well, actually, fiduciary relationships. Um, fiduciary relationships are really important. Um, we can see how um, the fiduciary relationships are being contravened constantly by uh, President Trump in the United States. Um, and it goes to the heart of our uh, system. And then that brings us to slide 182, which shows this guy with a sign that says the end is near and he's talking about the end of the world but the fellow from Wall Street thinks uh, he's being optimistic and means it's the end of the um, Wall Street uh, tanking and I just thought those you know I started off with a, uh, a Dilbert cartoon and I end with this one because cartoons <clears throat> um, if they're really good uh, really deal with life uh, and that is all there is. Um, let me just check my list. Yeah, that's it. Um, and there will be a Zoom session. Uh, <clears throat> and you'll have a chance to ask questions if I didn't cover something adequately enough. Thank you very much. And thanks for uh, suffering through my videos in this uh, crazy uh, uh, COVID-19 world. <laughs>